uh, you're all very welcome to what is our first master class on site for quite some time. So, although it is a little bit barn like, we are delighted to be here, delighted to have people on campus, and of course, most importantly, keeping you safe while, while you are on campus. It's a great pleasure to welcome Jim um, here today. Um, he's a graduate of NUI Galway on the double, has an MBA, obviously. Um, is a very f has very fond memories of his time here um, in NUI Galway. I would like to tell you that he was a really dedicated student and socially conscious and all of that, but <laughs> a lot of it revolved around you know other social activities as well as might might be the case. So we blame all of what has happened since in NUI Galway on on Jim, and uh, but we're delighted to have him here today and very welcome to the campus. We hope you'll be visiting us uh, again soon and often. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Anne will be our Master of Ceremonies for today to introduce Jim more formally. Yes, so I'll try to introduce you, Jim, in a few words. So since uh, 2008, uh, Jim, you're um, the CEO of Oxfam Island and um, Executive Director of Oxfam International. And with uh, his organization, Jim is working hard on um, getting everyone on board to uh, contribute uh, building a just and sustainable world uh, in which everyone can thrive. So Jim is also involved in several uh, other roles at national and uh, international levels. Since uh, August 2020, he's a commissioner at the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and has uh, also been appointed to uh, represent Ireland at the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, which is um, an EU body tasked with protecting the civil, political, as well as social and economical, um, economic rights of the EU citizens. Very recently, uh, Jim uh, was involved in the latest edition of the um, Business and Human Rights uh, Report published by the Irish Consortium for Human Rights. Jim was also appointed to the Forum on Family Friendly and Inclusive Parliament to recommend a transformation in how the Irish Parliament operates to ensure it's better gender balanced and diverse. And uh, I think the Forum presented its uh, recommendations to the Parliament last week or so, so very recently. As a passionate advocate for the rights of women, uh, Jim has driven a gender focus at Oxfam and uh, has led the Irish Consortium on gender-based violence. So he's a well-respected well -respected contributor to political and public debate here in Ireland and um, in a wide range of uh, international fora. And uh, last but not least, Prior to joining the, the international development sector, uh, Jim worked for over 15 years at senior management and uh, board level in a range of industries, including energy, pharma, environmental, construction, brewing, and startups. So he did an MBA approximately 10 years into uh, his career, which might have um, played a role in his subsequent um, career choices. So today, uh, Jim will uh, focus his presentation on the role of business in society and uh, talk it through uh, what business and, and business leaders are doing and can do to push the sustainability and human rights agenda. And uh, when we had a chat to, to prepare to this, today's session, we very much agreed that uh, the view of business systematically resisting the sustainability and human rights uh, agenda was very much cliché. And uh, today there's definitely a, a greater awareness uh, by business leaders uh, that they have a key role to play within society to push in the, in the right direction. Well, we can hardly argue, argue that uh, it's, this is enough, well, in particular regarding the, the urgency of, of the situation on the climate front, for example, where the move seems to be far too slow. Well, I think now it's time to give you the floor, Jim, and we are very much looking forward to uh, listening to your experience and views on the, on the subject. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anne. That was uh, really kind of you. I, I didn't recognize that fellow you were talking about, but anyway. Uh, 
Uh, it's, a, it's such an honour and a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm absolutely shocked to imagine that it's my first time back in what used to be called in, uh, UCG uh, in NUI Galway um, in a formal capacity since, since I left. So it's, it's a real honour to be amongst you and I, I'm really grateful to, to the team for inviting me to, to be here with you and share, share some ideas. Um, and just as, a, as an MBA uh, eventually graduate myself, I, I hope you're doing okay. Are you, you're all right? Are you? Yeah? Uh, nearly three quarters way there, right? Yeah? And you're still talking. Um, maybe not to each other, but yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an endurance test, right? Uh, and uh, look, you, you, you seem to be in pretty good shape, so, so well done. And uh, the college speaks very highly of you, so you're obviously, you're obviously doing, doing well. And uh, look, it's, uh, I have to say, you know, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, there's no point in pretending. And they throw, they throw a lot at you, but it's, um, it does prepare you well for, for other roles that no doubt you'll take up over, over time. And it, it kind of helps you to focus and helps you to, you know, work better with people, get to deadlines faster, uh, cut away the, the rubbish from the essential and, and all of that. And uh, while you're trying to live your busy lives and your, continue your work career as well. So it's, uh, I take my hat off to you and uh, wish you well, but you're, you're nearly there. So uh, you'll get there, no doubt, I'm sure. Um, so look, uh, let me get my little gadget here. Um, delighted to be here. Um, and the subject matter that we chose, uh, I'm very open to talking about a whole range of other things. So we'll, we'll start with this and then we'll open it up and see what, you, what, what particular areas you might like me to focus on in a bit more depth. I'm very happy to do that. Um, so first of all, I might just start giving you a little bit of background about who we are as Oxfam. So Oxfam, I mean, despite perceptions, it's not a British organisation, it's a global organisation. Uh, we have been in existence in Ireland since the late 1950s. Uh, and it's, it's made up of, of a number of independent uh, organisations that work together under what we call the Oxfam International Confederation. So my executive director role is, is as part of that body. So we work together to advance our collective agenda. And we do work very closely together. Um, and Oxfam in Ireland is an all-island organisation, so we work north and south as well, which adds a whole range of other interesting dynamics and, and aspects to the, to the job. Um, we, we describe ourselves as a movement of people that fight inequality to end poverty and injustice. So I'll, I'll unpick some of those things as we go along, um, because there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot underneath each, each of those. And last year we reached about 27.5 million people across 67 countries. So it's quite a large organisation um, and working in a, in a wide range of areas and in country, and countries. Um, so what we, we do three main things, uh, I suppose, and this, this tries to sum them up, but just what I, how I'll describe them is, is uh, we work on humanitarian crises. So when there's an emergency somewhere in the world, like a, a sudden, on, what we call a sudden onset emergency, like a, an earthquake or a typhoon or some major uh, natural disaster, uh, we work with communities uh, immediately on what we call life-saving work. So that's the humanitarian bit. And that's probably the bit that most often gets the headlines. That's the bit that you might see on the news. But in actual fact, it's only one part of the work. It's a vital part of it, but it's only one part of it. Uh, we work with communities and organizations and partner organizations, and we, we have about uh, 30,000 partner organizations across the world that we work with in different countries. And it's, it's all about ensuring that development that's happening in, in the countries in which we work is led by local communities. It's not led from here. It's not somebody that looks like me uh, telling people who live in sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia or in Latin America or wherever it might be in the Pacific uh, how, to, how to run their communities, their country or their lives. It's about those communities uh, working through their, the ideas that they have themselves and working through what works for them, where are the challenges, what they want to achieve and then how do we as an organisation help to support that financially, technically and then how do we leverage that to bring it up into other spaces and that's I suppose the third part of the work which is what we call our influencing work or our advocacy work. So that is looking to change the structures that keep people locked into poverty and inequality and I guess that's, if you like, that's probably what we're best known for in, in, in lots of ways but we do all the other stuff too if, if you know what I mean but we do have I suppose quite a, a loud global voice and we have been, you know, we're, we're well known for working on a whole range of, of issues and you might be familiar with um, our Davos report which we release every year at the World Economic Forum and it, it tends to grab a lot of headlines looking at the state of world inequality, for example, when, you know, when it was 
uh, just three years ago, just the eight wealthiest men, and they're all men in the world, own the same amount of wealth as the 3.6 billion poorest people. So it's quite staggering where inequality has gone. And the reason we talk about inequality and we, we focus on inequality is not because we have a, a problem with rich people. It's because the, 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 the wealth captured by that elite group it doesn't actually add a lot of economic value oftentimes. Oftentimes it's inherited wealth or it's wealth that's just been sat on. Uh, and it, it prevents others because, the way, because of the way it's structured and because of the way that that wealth is hidden away, uh, it prevents others from having access to very basic services such as health, education, social protection and so on. We can talk about that a little bit more later on. This is just a, a map of the places that we work, as I say, on all those kind of areas. Uh, what we call the right to be heard, so ensuring that people, and it's, it's, we're, we're blessed in this part of the world that we have freedom of expression, we have freedom of association, those kind of things, but it's, it's very challenged and challenging in other places, as you well know, and we know that civil society space, as we describe it, is being restricted, not just uh, in, in the global south, but certainly across Europe as well, and this is, a, this is an ongoing movement, and it's something we need to push back against, because civil society is is the mouthpiece for those most vulnerable in the world and, and for, for communities across the world. And if that's restricted, then it, it affects all of us and it affects, it affects um, a democracy overall. And then we work on sustainable food systems and, and then I suppose the, a, a key pillar of our work is what we call gender justice, which is basically women's rights. I mean, we see, first of all, the fact that, uh, that you know, more women are more affected by poverty, by extreme poverty, by disasters, by inequality, by the pandemic, by everything you can imagine than men are. That's the truth of the, of the world that we live in. Uh, and we have to transform that. We have to transform it that, that as we develop and as we look to find solutions to global problems, that women are at the heart of those solutions. Uh, otherwise, we will have an, un, an unbalanced and unequal society, which, damages, which is damaging for everybody, not just for women, but for men too for all, overall for society. So just specifically then in relation to, to business, um, and, and thank you, Anne, you, 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 you raised this point. I mean, we don't see uh, business as problematic. I mean, sometimes I think organizations that are campaigning organizations like to, you know, just critique. We do plenty of that, but we also work very closely with business. And we see the extraordinary opportunity that businesses have to, to make you know, a meaningful contribution to reducing poverty, to improving women's economic empowerment, and, and to tackling uh, human rights abuses and to, to dealing with lots of the issues that we have in the world. I mean, if you think about it, business has the resources, it has the, the global reach, it has the intellectual um, capacity, uh, it has the expertise, it has the innovation, it has the agility, and it has the, mo the money to be able to reach into other places that I, I often say within Oxfam for those who are being too critical of business and as I say we, we need to be oftentimes is that actually business will, will lift more people out of poverty than we ever will through creating jobs, innovation, solutions to problems that we see. So it's about a partnership and how do we, how can we work with business in a meaningful way. Um, so we, we, as I say, we, we work on advocacy issues when we have to and we, we challenge companies in lots of different uh, spaces. Uh, on, on a whole range of issues in relation to their behaviour and their, 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 their impact on human rights and their impact on women and their impact on, on environment and so on. But we also work very closely with business as a, we, we're a, a, an advisory body that supports business, works behind the scenes, helping businesses to, to resolve some of the issues that they face and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then we work very closely with a lot of companies as, as partners. So, you know, people say that, you know, it's, is it odd for me to have a business background and work in this space? I don't think it is at all. I think it's very consistent, and I think, Michael, you probably say the same. I mean, it's very consistent to work in this space. Um, business isn't something that sits outside of society. It's part of society. It's part of, we're all, we're all part of the same body of people, and, and we need to work together to solve these big, global, challenging issues. So, so why, why, should, why should business care? Uh, it's probably obvious, but just in case it isn't, I mean, there. There's so many aspects uh, of, of a company and of a, of a, of a business organisation that can be impacted when they don't care about business right, hum, uh, care about human rights, or when they don't look after the environment around them. And um, clearly, there are commercial and reputational risks um, to you know companies that are exposed, and we've seen plenty of uh, examples of that. Uh, companies risk being cancelled. Companies risk 
having having huge movement of, of shareholders and supporters, uh, of customers and of employees, um, to you know if 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 they're caught up in in scandals of, of human rights or, or environmental degradation and so on, and we have been working with companies for many years on you know both challenging them and helping them on the journey, and I can give some examples of those in a minute. And then, then you look at investors. I mean, the, the power of investors is where the money, you know, companies go where the money is. And we've been working with investor bodies to look at the, their investment portfolio to see how can they change uh, behaviors of companies by putting pressure or by threatening to move money. And just in the last while, the Investors for Human Rights Alliance, uh, which is a, is, a, is a group of 101 asset management companies across the world, have moved $4.3 trillion into funds that are, are, are ensuring that human rights are protected within the companies that work there. And that's very sizable and substantial. We see the Dutch pension fund, ABP, is divesting 15 billion euros um, away from fossil fuel producers uh, in the next two years. Uh, we see BlackRock, the big uh, investment company, has uh, invested in 300 projects uh, globally uh, worth 12 billion uh, in terms of uh, renewable energy. So the shareholders are, you know, are paying attention and they're they're interested and they see, you know, they see where the money needs to go. And 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 we certainly look to put pressure on them on those big institutional investors that, you know, they have real power in the world. But you can see that they the money tends to be ahead of everything else as we know in the world. So, you know, it's it's where the smart the smart money goes if you like and the the writing is on the wall. And then you have consumers and the power of consumers. And we have worked with um, both as a kind of an insider outsider approach with uh, a whole range of companies and a whole range of sectors over many years. I'll give you one example. It was a, uh, a program we had called Behind the Brands. So we looked at the top 10 food and beverage companies in the world. So you're talking about Coca Cola, Mondelez, Mix Cadbury's, Nestle, Unilever, and a number of others. And rather than just criticizing them, we, we we looked at seven key aspects of their of the potential impact they might have on human rights and and uh, and the environment, and we, we created a scorecard. And what we were trying to do was encourage a race to the top, rather than just slamming them for the things that they were getting wrong, and trying to create a positive sort of a, an emphasis and an environment for them to to consider how they might change their practice. And it actually worked quite effectively. And they started to compete amongst each other on things like. Uh, land rights. Uh, so Coca-Cola made a global commitment that they would ensure that there's no zero land grabbing within their entire supply chain uh, over a five-year period. Uh, and others followed suit. Others made huge commitments in relation to the rights of women workers throughout their supply chain, whether they be in the in the food processing factories or whether they be as women farmers that produce the food in the first place. So lots of lots of these things uh, have been consumer-driven. Uh, we. we we got consumers to put tremendous pressure on Coca-Cola, for example. I, I, was, I was speaking at an event in the OECD a few years ago, and I was sharing a platform with the senior VP, I never can understand some of these titles, but of strategy for Coca-Cola or whatever. And on the platform, he was lauding the work that Oxfam had done and putting pressure on them to, uh, on them to change their behavior. And afterwards, he said to me, you know, you really, you really annoyed us. And then he paused for a second, and he said, actually, what happened was, he said the, the senior, the most senior management in the company understood it straight away. He said, interestingly, the workers, in solidarity with others across the world, got it straight away. And those two put the pressure. He said the biggest problem was the middle management, presumably because the KPIs that they were to perform under were problematic based on changing the system that was there. But once you had the, the top management and you had the workers, it blew that argument out of the way. And he said they made the changes. So, the power of consumers is, is as you know, is, is extraordinary and, and, and change can happen, but you have to work with companies too. So it's a kind of, as I say, that insider-outsider approach. And the other group which isn't mentioned here, of course, is, is staff and people. So your people, and I'm sure you, you see this all the time, but staff and particularly staff of a certain generation, we, we, let's call them your generation. Our, our, I don't know, that's a bit of a stretch, right? Uh, so, so millennials and younger uh, are expected, you know, expect companies to behave, the companies they work for, to behave in a certain way. They, they line up with companies based on the values that they have and the company's, the company's values. And it's, it's an extraordinary kind of pressure when, you're, when companies are looking for the best talent, they're looking to retain the best talent, and they need 
they need to have that, that X factor that goes beyond the best pay packet that people, that the people will want to, to work and love working for their company because the mission is worthwhile and useful. Uh, and that is a really powerful driver for companies too. So there's, there's a lot of really good reasons why companies need to do this. Uh, the other uh, reason is because they're going to have no choice soon enough. <laughs> so we, we have been working on um, lobbying for EU mandatory due diligence legislation and um, uh, Commissioner, um, sorry I've forgotten her name now, the Irish, the Irish uh, Business Commissioner uh, Mairead, Mairead McGuinness is leading on this and this will become legislation uh, across Europe in the next year or two we expect. And when it does, each country will have to, will have to then transpose it into, into law. Uh, so what we're saying is that, look, you know, this is coming down the track. Companies need to be aware of it. Better to be aware of it now and make changes than, than have it imposed upon you. Better to be a first mover and get the advantage out of that. Better to get the credit from your consumers and from your staff and from everybody else. And position yourself to, to tackle the problems that you have within your, your value chains or within your organization so that you position yourself to, to, be, to be ready for this. Uh, and by the way, it's good for business. So that's, that's kind of what we're saying. And that's where, where we're headed. And I mean, the, there's a lot of really good work has been done on this over, over recent years. But at the point that we had made all along is that it had been voluntar voluntary. So you had kind of leading companies and you know, companies with, with a certain ethos and a certain kind of mission and, and values that were driving this. But it was quite unfair to them because others weren't and were gaining competitive advantage because they're not, because they're cutting corners, because they're, they're continuing to allow practices, which means some of their raw materials are a bit cheaper so they can compete in that sort of way. Um, but, they're, but they have, because they've done this, they've positioned themselves. But what, what the, the guiding principles, which is what are there at the moment, say that the, what, what needs to happen is we need to develop, the companies need to develop a public commitment to enable, to embed human rights and embed it across the organization. This is key. So oftentimes these types of things are sent to the sustainability department if you have a big enough company or the, or the um, ethics department or the risk part of the organization, whatever. We say it needs to be organization-wide from top to bottom. Everybody needs to be aware of what needs to be done and they need to, they need to embed it in the way they work and, and, and to have the, the radar up for, in, 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 for example, in purchasing for where problems might arise, or in sales, or in PR, or whatever it might be. When, when the company can be just off on some things and it mightn't realize it, but because they're coming at a very specific angle within the company, they can see it differently to others and they can add huge value to the way the company needs to change. And they need to establish an ongoing process of human rights due diligence, so set up some system internally. And we're trying to emphasize that this doesn't have to be uh, so scary and difficult. It depends on the scale of the company, but I mean, it, it really, you know, it can be manageable, and it, it is manageable, and it can be done, uh, and it needs to be done. And then to make sure that they have grievance mechanisms through which uh, people can flag issues or complaints, and then to provide remedy. So there's no point in allowing uh, a problem to persist. I mean, put your hand up, there's a problem somewhere in a supplier company that we have, and we know it, we're going to deal with it, we're going to work with the company, we're not just necessarily going to ostracize them because that can cause knock-on impacts for people who are relying on the jobs of that company, but actually we work with them to transform their, their work practices to make sure that they're consistent with the rights that people need to have. Um, and this is, uh, this, is, this is vital too. Um, so what we do as Oxfam, we support companies, we, we help them to carry out human rights impact assessments. Now, oftentimes these types of things by large companies can you know, manifest as a sort of a book exercise and, and a, desk, a piece of desk work, which we don't believe really works because the danger there is that if you're on a, on a, a long value chain or supply chain uh, to, to, the, to, the, to get to the end consumer and if you're at, the, at that other end of it, you don't necessarily know what's happening. And you, you, you might get reports from your supplier companies, but can you really believe everything that you read and can you, can you stand over it? So what we do is we carry out uh, human rights impact assessments directly with communities affected. And because we have such a wide global footprint, because we work in all of these countries and because we work in these places, we can actually speak to communities because we're, we're working with partners. It isn't us parachuting in, it's partners who are belonging to that community can talk about the, the rights of workers and the, the, the impacts that the companies are having in that space. Uh, and then have, have very meaningful discussions and then you know, work at you know, assessing the impacts, integrating and acting upon the, the impacts. 
tracking the performance and communicating on performance. And this is a challenging bit for companies oftentimes is to communicate on this. Nobody expects companies to be perfect. Uh, and it is, you know, there's no, there's no organization in the world that's perfect, including Oxfam uh, and including, dare I say, NUI Galway. Oh, there it's nearly there. Um, the, but the, you know, they're, they're, and people are forgiving. So, you know, be honest, be open and say, look, we have these issues, uh, but now we know about them, we're going to do something about it. And it'll, it'll take time and we get there. So just to give you an example, this is a, we, we, worked with, we, we work with companies across the world, as I say. Um, one that we worked with in recent years is a company called SOK. They're the largest uh, food retailer in Finland. They have revenues of about 11.5 billion. Uh, they have 30,000 different supply chain, um, complex supply chains to, to, to do that. And we, we partnered with them on a particular project around tomatoes. Uh, and it was the, the tomato production in southern Italy. I wouldn't have known this, I don't know if you know this, but 40% of the world's tomatoes are grown in Italy. Uh, and so it's a massive industry. Um, and it is one that, because of where it's based in southern Italy, which is, is very exposed to, to refugees and migrants crossing the, crossing the Mediterranean, um, there's a real vulnerability for people in that part of the world to be exploited. Uh, and so SOK hired us to work with them to, to, to do a deep dive into the communities of, in that part of, of Italy to understand properly what was happening in their area. And there were huge risks in relation to exploitation on wages, in relation to exploitation on working time, in appalling living conditions, on a shocking health and safety record. I mean, during the course of our project, there were 16 people killed in just in transport to work because of unsafe vehicles and because piling, piling people into trucks just to, to get the tomatoes picked and so on. And this is happening in Europe, so this isn't, you know, obviously we work across developing countries in the global south, but this is in Europe too. So um, it, was, it was pretty shocking to, to learn that this was possible and that this was happening. Um, but to be fair, the company looked, looked at it, I mean they argued with some elements of it, obviously they had to defend themselves too, but they were willing to, first of all they were willing to engage in it and they were willing to embrace it and, and then look at how it could be scaled. So this was one particular piece of work we did there and how can you do that elsewhere? Uh, and what we would say is that it was vital to have access, so we wouldn't have known that if they had just given us the name or if, if they had just themselves accessed their, their um, suppliers, their three or four or dozen or whatever it was suppliers in Italy that supplied them with various tomato products and um, they would have got the nice shiny report and they would have got the all clear kind of thing. Unless you actually speak to communities, unless you're there, you will never know really what's happening and that's, that's absolutely vital. And as I say, commercial transparency is, is possible because the way we were able to report on this, it didn't expose uh, commercial sensitivities in terms of costs and so on, which we, you know, which we were, we were, we had access to, they were very very um, willing to share a lot of confidential information on that basis. Uh, and then to look at the root causes, and then obviously to develop an action plan, which they did and which they've been working on since, and it is transforming the way uh, that particular production is, is happening in that part of, of, uh, of Italy. So it is, so as I say, it's just, just an example, but there, there are many others. So um, then just moving it along a little bit, um, we talk about sustainable future and sustainable development and you know it sounds very jargonistic um, and what does it really mean and what, what's it all about. I happened to be at the Sustainable Development Goal Conference in 2015 when the, when the agreement was signed. I was, I was part of the negotiations. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but it was an Irish guy, David, uh, David I think his name is second, who was the, who was the actual the pen holder who wrote, who wrote the document. So it is a global agreement written by both Kenya and Ireland. Uh, and was signed up to by 190 countries. And I'm sure you're familiar with it, and I was delighted to see it in your program uh, of your work, and, and I know that it's embedded in your business and community, business and society, society sorry, uh, and, and it's a key part of where you're working. And this, this in itself is, it shows the, the way that business is transforming when a business school sees the importance of that. And I have to give credit to, to Galway for, for the work that you've done in that area. And um, so what, we're, what we look at is, Sorry, this was this was the quote from John Ruggie. So John Ruggie was the guy who actually wrote the original um, guiding principles. Unfortunately, he passed away about two weeks ago before he saw these go into law. But he did. They have been in place for for ten years, and you can see the this idea that uh, 
really he's kind of having a little bit of a go at CSR here. I mean, it's all very fine to throw a few bob in the in the can to, to make your company look good or to support some local organization or some you know more, something larger maybe. But really, it's changing the way you work is, is where the challenge is. And that's where the meaningful impact would come. Um, and this is uh, the former head of uh, Danone, who we, we also worked with through our food, our food work. So there's an identification, you see it's people like Paul Polman, I don't know if you've come across him, he's the C former CEO of, of uh, Unilever, he's become a bit of a world leader on sustainable development and being an integral part of it. And what really struck me as interesting is when I was at the STG Summit, um, the level of of business engagement was enormous. I mean, when you go to a lot of these kind of global conferences, we were talking about them uh, earlier, earlier on with Anne, um, oftentimes it's, it's civil society actors and it's governments and it's a big kind of a, you know, attritious sort of a negotiation. But in this instance, the businesses were there in force and there was, what was really interesting for me is there was a full page ad taken out in the New York Times by, by the Chambers of Commerce of North America and what they were doing was actually putting pressure on government to be more ambitious. So usually you have government trying to put pressure on business to do the right thing or whatever, uh, but actually the businesses themselves. So the, the, the opportunity for business to lead in these areas is, is, is huge. I'm going to get back to that in a second actually. Uh, sorry. Um, so, so yeah, so how can, how can businesses change? I mean, what we need to see is, um, I suppose, companies fully understanding what it means by sustainability, fully embedding uh, sustainability within their entire systems. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great week to be here uh, when COP is happening and when we, we see the, the climate talks and you know, we have uh, teams over there working on, working on the negotiations. We had meetings with, with uh, Simon Coveney and Eamon Ryan and obviously UN delegates and other countries this week. And, um, I, I don't know if you saw the footage of Mary Robinson in tears the other night because uh, it looks like the, the agreement, as it currently stands, is going to get us to 2.4 degrees or 2.7, perhaps, when 1.5 is where we need to get to. Um, but it's it, it is it's in the interests of all of us to get this right. I mean, if we don't get this right, we're all you know where we all are. Um, and it's um, you know how how companies can be part of that and how we as individuals can be part of that is is challenging but essential. And how we can push our own government to be more, to be more ambitious. I mean, there's a whole rolling back in the last day of the um, of the pressures on the extractives industry, particularly uh, coal and oil, uh, and we see the watering down of, of lots of language in terms of human rights and, and particularly women's rights, and we have to continue to push back on that. But but companies can play a vital role, in my view, in putting pressure on governments themselves and saying, look, you know, if we don't have a sustainable environment we don't have a business we don't have a space to to operate and um, you know as it currently stands we could lose a huge part of Bangladesh and uh, we have islands in the Pacific where Oxfam works that are currently being submerged they're disappearing uh, and then of course we've seen the impacts here there's a in the US last year it cost a hundred billion dollars to 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 repair damage that caused by the fires and and uh, and the droughts so it's very real, it's happening now. I mean, we've seen it. I, I brought, I don't know if you know, Tony Connolly is the RTE and the specialist on Brexit now, but he was a generalist. I brought him to Malawi nearly 10 years ago, and we met farmers who were impacted right then by climate change and the impact of that. And why we talk about climate justice uh, in Oxfam is because uh, farmers in Malawi didn't cause, the, cause climate change. It's us here through our lifestyles over the last 100 odd years that have caused climate change. The entire continent of Africa produces about 2% of global emissions uh, today, and obviously a lot less in the past. So, I mean, the responsibility lies here. The, the two elements of change that need to happen are what's called mitigation, which is us transforming the way we, we emit carbon to reduce it dramatically. And the other one is adaptation, which is the finance that needs to be delivered to, to uh, share or to, to give to developing countries, particularly to protect against the changes that are already happening. So flood defenses, uh, development in agriculture to change crops and so on, um, and and uh, and what we need to see from the climate talks is a is a, a proper commitment to that, and we've never seen that. There's been a lot of really good talk, but no no firm commitments, and it has to happen yesterday. It can't happen in 10 years' time. We can't kick this can any further down the road, or we're we're all in huge huge trouble. So it is um, it is vital, and you know companies' role then in that is you know okay, how do they 
how do we look to every element of the way your business is run to see you know what changes can be made small changes even if you're in a small organization can actually will, will add up I mean you know two years ago it would have been unthinkable to go through the changes that we've all gone through in the last in that period you know if you, if you talk to any of us here in November two years ago and, and then March was around the corner it would have been unthinkable that we'd all be working from home. It would be unthinkable that none of us fly anywhere. It would be unthinkable that we do a load of things. But we did it, you know. And, and the climate emergency is even more severe than the pandemic in terms of its longer term impact. So, you know, it really has to be about, you know, the willingness and the, the political kind of uh, willingness and the company's willingness to, to, to roll with these changes and to, to make sure that they, they commit in each way. I was going to just give you a little example of some stuff that we're doing ourselves. Um, so, as well as doing our international work and, and our advocacy and influencing work here in Ireland, we, we actually have a business of our own. So we have 47 retail outlets across the island of Ireland. Um, and, you know, if you haven't been in one of them recently, I recommend that you go. But, um, we, you know, the perception is this old, dusty old, smelly old uh, charity shop. Well, actual fact, something like 60% of all of our product is brand new. Uh, we're working with uh, Burberry, we're working with M&S, we're working with um, many other uh, retailers, some, some that uh, we're doing it privately behind the scenes, they don't want to go public on it, so I can't mention, but um, looking at how, how we help them in their, in their supply chains, and how do we help them with end of line product, how do we help them to, to bring back product and so on. I mean, the fashion is the second most polluting industry in the world uh, after oil and gas. I mean, I would not have known that until we started to, to dive into this. It emits 1.2 billion tonnes of CO2 every year, um, and it is the, the fourth largest cause of environmental pressure after food and tra uh, housing and transport. And here's one that I didn't know, that it, it is worse for the environment than air travel and shipping combined. So if you think about that, and that's just the clothes we wear, and our kind of casual approach to them, I suppose, if we're to be honest. And this isn't meant to be preachy, by the way, I'm the same as, well, clearly I'm a man of high fashion, as you can see, but, um, <laughs> but they, you know, it's just consumer, as consumers, we, we, have, we have a duty and we have a responsibility. But actually there are ways around it. So we, we, um, we, we're, we're working with these companies to, to bring those products would, would have ended up in landfill or being incinerated back into the value chains and, and um, giving them another life and then further after that making sure that the materials that went into them are recycled and then and then used again. So it really is and it's just a small example of something we can do as a as a not a huge organization. Um, but it just goes to show that there are probably a, a lot of things within your own organizations that you might be able to do that you haven't thought of yet. And certainly we're very happy to work with you and, and, and coming up with ideas and, and teasing out things that might be might be suitable for you. And so what we've been talking about is this idea of the circular economy and we managed to, to get the terms in relation to the circular economy into the programme for government. Not a lot has happened on it yet, but it's good that it's in there, so at least it's starting to enter into the lexicon. It was a, to this idea of, of things you know, continually going around rather than constantly being, being dumped or being extracted. And, uh, you know, and it applies to so many things. It applies in, in electronics, it applies in, in lots of consumer goods and lots of other areas. Uh, and as I say, there are some of the partners that we work with. Um, so then finally I was asked to kind of consider the sort of leadership roles that, that, um, that are needed for this kind of next generation of business, if you like, as, as, as we see it. Um, and, you know, and these are just some thoughts, but I'm mean, very happy to explore this and have a chat about it. But certainly one where, you know, the voice of, of business leaders like yourselves and those you work with um, are authentic. You know, that, that if you say you're, you're going to commit to these areas, that, that you do it with, you know, realistically based on what you, what's achievable um, and then stick with it, even though it'll be challenging along the way, oftentimes. Um, accountability, and this is accountability uh, across the organization, from the leaders all the way through, so that, um, that you feel a sense of accountability to your own teams and to, your, to the wider community in which you work, that you, know, that you can be proud of. Look, I, my company and myself, we're doing as much as we can. And when we're not, we will we'll put our hand up and say, actually, there are things here we can do better. Uh, and I think consumers and customers and others will be forgiving and open. 
Um, empathy is always good in life. Um, so, you know, empathy kind of has a habit of, of, of multiplying. So if you can, if you can show that empathy to, towards others, uh, others will be willing to show it too. And uh, I think that's, that's just an important kind of, uh, kind of lesson for life, I suppose, for me anyway. But, um, and the other one is then is, is just ensuring that there's constant learning and constant challenge. And I'm sure anybody who's in this class is here for that reason anyway. But just that you, you know, we all get into our comfort zones very easily and we like to stay in the lane then when we get there because it suits our world. Um, but the reality is, is there's no such thing. <laughs> So it's just constantly being able to challenge yourself, challenge your organisation, challenge those around you, in a, in a safe way, in a way that's not not there to to um, reduce down the, the value of what anybody's doing, but actually say, actually, you know, there are there there are things coming that we can make this better. There are technologies coming. There are problems we've identified. There are issues, and I mean, honesty, and and I suppose um, humility is is key in that and. Certainly, as Oxfam, we've had plenty of problems, and we've had to, you know, I think it's 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 important to face up to them, and to be willing to to be accountable, and to be willing to be vulnerable when you need to be, uh, and honest. So there's some of, some of the ideas, but um, it's kind of a bit, a bit wide ranging that. But I'm very happy to to talk about a whole range of other areas in relation to the sector, in relation to business, in relation to how you survive the next six months, and whatever whatever uh, whatever you'd like to to talk about. Now I don't know how long I went on for, but. That was okay. It was a great framing of the question, I suppose. <laughs> More challenging than the, than the standard version of that. Um, yeah, so why did I move? I, I, I suppose, look, I, I studied here and I grew up in Ireland of a certain time when you, um, when you graduated, if you got a job, you, you were inclined to hold on to it or you were encouraged to. I was lucky to, I did a placement from Galway that brought me to West Cork and I got a job in a small but ambitious company and I had a really good managing director who gave me the keys to go off and come up with new ideas and we set up manufacturing plants around the place and we exported all over the world and we did some really interesting things for a, quite a small company. Um, but I always, in the back of my mind, wanted to do something in international development or in the space. But I mean, bear in mind, you know, when I was growing up, it, it was very much about the charity model, which is something that we, we don't talk about anymore. And I know, I know that there are people here who work in, in charities and we, I, I'm sure you'd agree with me. We, we talk about them as, as human rights organisations, as as organisations that that support others to, you know, to to gain equality, to to achieve that kind of equal status and you know, equality in the world to fight inequality, to to deal with kind of some of the burning issues that that people would have, whether it's homelessness or whether it's disability or whether it's um, a whole range of issues in relation to women's rights and and so on. Um, and the reason I say that is because the, the concept of charity, particularly when you're dealing in the global north to the global south, which is a lot of our work, is, you know, inverted commas, the rich white person from here giving generously to the poor black person there, which is, which is racist, actually, if you think about it, as well as everything else. And, and the truth of it is we, we look to the, the fact that as humans, we're all equal. And as humans, we're all entitled to, and we have rights across a whole range of areas that are universal. And so really what we're supposed to be doing is, is helping people to realize those rights in whatever way we can. And I suppose I, I, I kind of, I thought I'd do it for a, a year and I'd kind of get out of my system. So I, I, after I did my MBA, I, I was the, um, I, I was the, I suppose, the COO of a, of a company that provided uh, for the, the gas, gas pipeline and, and into the farm and into the uh, electrical, uh, sorry, into the electric generation industry and so on. Um, 
but I always wanted to do this thing. So eventually, uh, I kind of ran out of time. I thought, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. Um, a bit like an MBA. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I went off, and, uh, and I was looking to sign up to an organization, and rightly so, I suppose, but a lot of organizations don't take volunteers to go overseas anymore because, I mean, why, why would you send somebody like me when you have brilliant local people who know, <laughs> know so much more than I do? But at the time, there was still a window, and as it turned out, um, there was, a, there was a gig in South Sudan. Now, I didn't realize at the time, because I didn't know much about Africa, I have to confess, um, that, I, that there, there, wasn't, there was the reason that there wasn't a huge queue, because it was a, it was a particularly difficult environment to work in. It, it was a conflict, and there was, it was a very uh, poor part of the world, and, and very challenged. And it was, a, it was a transformative experience, to be perfectly honest. And I came back, and I... Where did you I, I went to South Sudan. South Sudan, so, um, and it was an amazing experience and I learned more and I, I got more, much more out of it than I contributed, I'm, I'm absolutely sure of that. But it did, then I found it harder to go back into mainstream uh, business afterwards and then opportunities came up and I sort of stumbled into this. But I don't, I don't think I've ever left that sense of a business, I mean I, we run our organisation like a business, it's a business, we have, we have just different stakeholders to a lot of your businesses here, I mean we have different customers and we have different suppliers and we have different funders, but at the end of the day we have to run it well and we, there's a, a greater level of scrutiny on organisations like us, as there should be, uh, in terms of where our money comes from and where it goes and how it's spent and how it's invested. And I mean that's, that's something we take very seriously and you have, to, you have to have the business expertise to be able to do that, you have to invest in governance. We're I'm happy to say we're, we've been uh, nominated for a Best Governance Award next week, so fingers crossed. Uh, and, and look, these are things that are important, and I think you, you don't lose those sense, and I, you shouldn't, but it doesn't mean you can't put the mission at the heart of what you're doing either. So it's about getting that balance right. So that's a very long answer to a, a short enough question. So, yeah, why uh, I kind of, it's a circuitous route to the work I do, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very honoured and privileged to have the role that I do, and uh, I'm just waiting for the tap on the shoulder. Somebody say, come on now. Come on now, Jim. Seriously? <laughs>